If you do like these tank chats, do please subscribe to the Tank Museum's YouTube channel. Now this is TV 15,000. It's actually a unique vehicle. It was the, in effect, the prototype of the whole Scorpion range. And it gives us a chance to see where Scorpion came from. And it was built at FVRDE, that's the Fighting Vehicle Research and Development Establishment, which was at Chertsey. It was built in their workshops and rolled out on Christmas Eve 1965 just to give them something to drink champagne over, I suppose. It was built with the idea of creating a CVR type thing in the end. It's actually powered by a Rolls-Royce R-series engine. Now that's a six-cylinder engine. It was the type of engine, if you remember them, used in the, um, the Rolls-Royce Phantom Plus Princess, which was actually no more than an Austin Westminster done up to look a bit classy, but that's what a, the engine was. It drove through a Rolls-Royce gearbox into a sort of um, combined um, transmission and um, steering unit in the front. It really was quite an unusual vehicle. It's odd that they didn't use the B60 engine, which um, you would have thought was more suitable, but they didn't. They chose the, the original Austin car one instead. Built of aluminium, it's well ventilated, as you can see. Now, the other strange thing about it is that it actually has hydrogas suspension. If you look at it, you can see that in addition to the road wheels with their hydrogas suspension, it's, it's got return rollers. Now, you won't find any return rollers on Scorpion. Scorpion, the wheel fills the whole gap between the lower and upper run of the track. This one's slightly different. But it was, it was an amazing vehicle, it had a terrific performance. But it was built purely as an experiment, a, a prototype for this new vehicle that became Scorpion later on. So it is quite unusual. But what is even more unusual, that it survived. After all these years from when it was built, to find it here now, and uh, been a, they've been able to do it up quite nicely, is quite remarkable. The turret, which is only a dummy, was put on the hull later to make it look a bit more like a CVR, but that was only a part of the sort of decoration, really. The hull was what mattered with this engine in. The engine was later changed. They later installed a Jaguar engine, probably installed other engines as well, but they were very limited for width with all of them. And the Jaguar engine was the one decided on for Scorpion, so that's why that was tested in here. And really that's what this is. Otherwise it's basically a Scorpion with this new type of suspension. But the hull's about the same, a little bit more crudely welded, but it was done in a bit of a hurry. But quite an interesting vehicle. And it gives us a chance to see where Scorpion came from. Now this vehicle is the Scorpion. It's rather a lightweight vehicle. In fact, you would look at it and think of it as a light tank. Not that anyone would use the term light tank in these days. It's uh, Britain made such a mess of their light tanks during the Second World War that the term has vanished completely from the, the record now. But it's still essentially a light tank. It's actually down as a combat vehicle reconnaissance in brackets tracked if you want to be specific about it but that's what they call it anything but a light tank it's a term they hate although it has all the features of a light tank now the first thing i should say is this is one of the prototypes you can tell straight away by the number plate if you're a collector of number plates otherwise the spoked wheels the at least the holes in the wheels are usually a good guide to a vehicle that was built as a prototype. They built quite a number of prototypes to try and work out which was, you know, whether it would perform very well or not. And it's actually an interesting vehicle. It's one of a family, which we'll look at in due course, but the Scorpion was the name vehicle of the family. FV101 was its number, and it um, 
is still quite an impressive vehicle, although they're not used anymore, and I'll come to that in a minute as well. For a start, the vehicle is built of aluminium, at least it's an aluminium alloy. They didn't build this one of steel, so in that sense, it's rather like the M113 in America, built of aluminium. The only difference is that this was the first complete vehicle built of aluminium, from its body to its turret, everything else is aluminium and that meant that the weight comes down quite a bit. Actually, it doesn't save that much weight. Generally speaking, with aluminium armour, you need it to be about three times as thick as steel armour, so that the actual the weight difference has hardly exists. But there is a difference, and that's that the internal dividers aren't necessary. The hull becomes stronger because it's thicker, and therefore you don't need the internal divisions that you have in some steel-built vehicles of the same sort of size. So in that sense, it does save a bit of weight. It's powered by a Jaguar six-cylinder engine. It's quite unusual. They tried a few other engines, but they decided the Jaguar was the best. It was powerful. They did a derated version. It's the same engine as you'd find in a 4.2-litre Jaguar, but brought down to a more reasonable sort of speed for tank use, but it was narrow, that was the secret. They needed an engine that would fit alongside the driver. The driver's under that hatch there, and the engine's to his right, and you, you had to have the engine as narrow as possible to fit in. It drives through a TN15, it's a combined gearbox and steering unit in the front here, driving the front sprockets. Quite unusual for a British vehicle, again, to be driven at the front. But that's the general mechanical layout of the thing. It has a hull designed to carry one man, a driver, and the two others, commander and gunner, are in the turret. Now the turret is fitted with a 76 millimetre gun, which is itself a development of the old Saladin gun. The same sort of gun, it's a 76 millimetre weapon, fairly short, with a reasonable anti-armour capability, but not marvellous. You wouldn't want to go up against a tank and it, you'd get wiped out, but that's the idea. But that's it, the 76 millimetre gun, which is a development of the gun fitted to Saladin, with next to it, the image intensifier would go, that's that box-like thing, to the side of the gun there, and then the smoke discharges on either side. And that's the whole layout of the vehicle. It's very compact, you could say cramped in a sense. Um, the first ones, those produced as prototypes, generally don't have the stowage boxes you see on the later ones. And you'll see that as we, we go on. Um, but it, it, that, that was why they were all done to make them as light as possible. It's the same with the crew. You would think in a way, if the army was, had, had their hearts set on making the light, they'd have a, a team of naked men to drive and operate the tank. But they don't. The man will insist on getting dressed up to get in the tank, and they want to wear NBC suits half the time, which are even bulkier. So getting the driver in was a difficult problem anyway. Never mind whether he was a slim fellow to begin with or a fat fellow. Um, they've got to get somebody to squeeze into the driver's position there. And that's difficult enough. They're very fast, very agile vehicles with torsion bar suspension and quite light, quite a lot of power and um, a, a nasty habit of giving off a terrific heat signature from that Jaguar engine, which is the big problem with them. This one is actually fitted with a flotation screen. It's fitted all the way round on the top of the hull you raise it up and it's rather like a camera bellows, a sort of zigzaggy pattern of fabric with a transparent paddle in the, in the front that the driver can look out of, give him some idea where it's going. The only trouble is that under normal circumstances, the Scorpion's running on its tracks and it does the same in the water. It uses the tracks as paddles and frankly they're nearly useless. It'll go wherever the current or tide takes it. It won't just whiz along in the water, as you'd hope. They did produce a clip-on um, drive system with proper propellers both sides, 
but you, you can't carry those around in a vehicle. There's nowhere to put them. And the odd chances of crossing a river are fairly slim anyway. So um, they did away with the whole business in the end, the whole business of the, the screen and everything else. Now we'll come to the big problem. When they fired this gun, which was the main purpose of it, of course, you got a, quite a feedback of fumes, especially out of the breech when you were reloading it. And the Royal Air Force, who also used the Scorpion, began to wonder if the fumes were a bit toxic. So they complained about it. The um, trial was carried out at the Armoured Trials and Development Unit up the road. They carried it out on the Scorpion and they fired a number of 76 millimetre rounds and discovered that the fume build up in the turret was actually quite bad. And it meant that the men were breathing worse than smoking. You wouldn't have that, I mean, at any price. So um, they did away with Scorpion altogether. They couldn't cure it, at least it didn't have, they didn't have, for instance, power traverse in the turret because it was expensive and it took up room. That was a mistake and they, they did adopt it later on. But the scorpion itself vanished. They were here one minute and gone the next. There's a few around, but mostly they were reworked. Um, some, some of them, I think, were reworked into a unit called the Sabre, which had a 30 mil turret like a um, scimitar on top. But that's the idea. Anything except as, as scorpion fighting vehicles. That was completely non, not, not to be considered now, and the whole thing vanished. And that's the reason. It was a fume build-up making the turret unpleasant, at least, for the two men who were in there. That's why it was done away with. In these difficult times, obviously your support is really valued. So please do keep following us on social media, do subscribe to our channel, and, and if you've got the opportunity, perhaps order something from our shop, uh, join one of our schemes like Patreon or our friends organisation, and we'll try and keep going with giving you some content to keep you informed and entertained.